In mechanics, a body is any object to which a force may be applied. Examples of bodies include blocks, pendulums, and vehicles. A rigid body is one that is not deformed when a force is applied to it. Its shape is not altered by the force. A particle is a body that has mass but whose other dimensions are considered to be negligible. The size and shape of a particle are too small to be worth considering. In practice, larger bodies are often treated as particles when they're small relative to their surroundings. A lamina is a flat body which has area but negligible thickness. A hollow body is a shell which has negligible thickness but takes up some volume. A force may be defined as that which causes or tends to cause a change in the state of rest or the uniform motion of a body. If a body is moved from rest, a force must have been applied. If a body moving at constant velocity changes its velocity, then again, a force must have been applied. A change in velocity of a body is an acceleration. Therefore, a force causes an acceleration. A force is characterized by its magnitude, its direction, and its type. Because both the magnitude and direction of a force are significant, Forces of vector quantities. Types of force in mechanics include weight, pushes and pulls, friction, normal reaction, tension and thrust. Force is a vector quantity. The SI unit of force is the newton. One newton is the force required to give a mass of one kilogram an acceleration of one meter per second per second. The weight of a body is the force of attraction which the Earth exerts on the body. Weight is sometimes referred to as the force due to gravity. It acts at the center of gravity of the body and is directed vertically downwards. A light body is one which, for calculation purposes, is considered to have no mass and is therefore weightless. An example of a light body is a string with a body attached, where the weight of the string itself is ignored in any calculation. Weight must always be assumed to act on a body unless it is specifically defined as a light body. Pushing and pulling forces are those which act on a body at a point. Again, they are vector quantities and have a specific direction. Friction is a contact force existing between a body and a rough surface. It acts along the common surface and in a direction that opposes any motion of the body. A normal reaction force is one which exists on a body in contact with a surface. It acts at right angles to the direction of the surfaces in contact. Tension is a force which can act in strings, springs or rods. It is a pulling force which is exerted by the string, spring or rod on a body to which it is attached. Thrust is a force exerted by a compressed spring or rod. It acts in the opposite direction to tension, that is, towards the body causing the compression. Force diagrams represent the forces present in mechanics. If the magnitude and direction of enough of the forces are known, the others can be calculated. 
drawing a force diagram is often the best way to begin answering a typical mechanics question.
Displacement is the position of a point or body relative to another known point. It is a vector quantity. The SI unit of displacement is the meter. Distance is the magnitude of a displacement. It is a scalar quantity. Velocity is the rate of change of displacement with respect to time. It is a vector quantity. The SI unit of velocity is the meter per second. The magnitude of the velocity of a body is its speed. Speed is a scalar quantity. The average velocity of a moving body is the change in displacement of the body divided by the time taken for this change to occur. The average speed of a moving body is the total distance travelled by the body divided by the time taken. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. It is a vector quantity. The SI unit of acceleration is the meter per second squared, or meter per second per second. A special case in kinematics occurs when bodies move in one dimension only. In this case, they may only move in one of two possible directions along a line. For one-dimensional motion, the two possible directions need to be distinguished. This is done by describing one direction as being positive and the other negative with regard to all of the quantities involved. It does not matter which direction is chosen to be positive, provided all of the quantities in this direction are treated as numerically positive and all those in the opposite direction as negative. A special case of one-dimensional motion is where bodies move vertically under gravity. For a body accelerating steadily from an initial velocity to a final velocity, the uniform acceleration of the body is found by dividing the change of velocity by the time taken for the change to occur. As the change in velocity occurs steadily, the average velocity is the mean of the initial and final velocities. The average velocity also equals the displacement of the body divided by the time taken for that displacement to occur. The four equations of uniform straight-line motion are presented here. These equations can be used to find the value of any term when the values of three terms are known. For each component of a calculation, the five quantities should be listed as shown in this example. A body moving vertically under gravity is an example of one-dimensional motion. Such motion can be either downwards, upwards, or in both directions. The equations of uniform motion apply, with the acceleration of the body being that due to gravity. If a body is dropped, then it is normal to take the initial direction of motion, that is downwards, as positive. If a body is projected vertically upwards, then it is usual to take the upwards direction of motion as positive. In such cases, the body falling back down is indicated by negative values of velocity.
If a particle moves in a straight line, its displacement, s after time t, is given by s equals f of t. The velocity of the particle v is the rate of change of displacement of the particle with respect to time. If v is zero, then the particle is at rest. If v is greater than zero, then the particle must be moving in the direction in which s is measured. If v is less than zero, then the particle must be moving in the opposite direction to that in which s is measured. The acceleration of a moving particle is the rate of change of velocity of the particle with respect to time. If a is zero, then the velocity of the particle is constant. If a is greater than zero, then the particle is accelerating. If a is less than zero, then the particle is being retarded.
A force may be defined as that which causes or tends to cause a change in the state of rest or the uniform motion of a body. If a body is moved from rest, a force must have been applied. If a moving body changes its velocity, then too a force must have been applied. As velocity is a vector quantity, if either the magnitude or direction changes, then this represents a change in velocity. Consequently, a body moving with constant speed that changes direction must have been acted on by a force. Mass and weight are not the same. The mass of a body is a measure of how much matter it contains. A body with a large mass will require a large force to change its motion. The mass of a body is constant and independent of its location, provided no matter is added to or removed from the body. Mass is a scalar quantity. The SI unit of mass is the kilogram. The weight of a body is the force that the Earth's gravity exerts on the body. The weight of a body depends on its location. A body close to the surface of the Earth will have more weight than one at a distance. As weight is a force, it is a vector quantity. The SI unit of weight is the Newton. One Newton is the force required to give a mass of one kilogram an acceleration of one meter per second per second. The mass in kilograms and the weight in newtons of a body are related by the equation W equals mg, where g is the acceleration due to gravity. The value of g varies at different places, resulting in the variation of the weight of a body. Newton's first law of motion states that a body will continue in its state of rest or uniform motion unless a resultant external force acts on it. As a consequence, if a body is accelerating, there must be a resultant external force acting on it. If a body is not accelerating, the forces acting on it must be in equilibrium. The resultant external force must be zero. Newton's second law of motion states that the rate of change of momentum of a moving body is proportional to the resultant external force acting on the body and takes place in the direction of the force. When an external force acts on a body of constant mass, the acceleration produced is directly proportional to the force. The equation representing Newton's second law of motion is force equals mass times acceleration. When more than one force acts on a body, the force F is the resultant of the combined forces acting. The force and the acceleration it produces act in the same direction. A constant force applied to a body of constant mass produces a constant acceleration. Newton's third law of motion states that if a body A exerts a force on a body B, then B exerts an equal and opposite force on A. This is sometimes stated as action and reaction are equal and opposite. Consider a stationary car on a bridge. The car exerts a force on the surface of the bridge. The bridge exerts an equal and opposite force on the car. The two forces indicated must be equal and opposite, or the car would accelerate in the direction of any resultant force. Newton's laws apply to any motion, however it may be caused. They apply whether the force producing the motion or change in motion is constant or variable. If a force F varies in a known way, it is possible to represent the motion by a differential equation.
Newton also formulated a law relating the forces of attraction between any two bodies in the universe. This is known as the law of universal gravitation. If two bodies of mass m1 and m2 are situated so that the center of mass of m1 is r meters from the center of mass of m2, then the force of attraction F between them is given by the formula shown here. Newton named the constant G, the universal gravitational constant. The gravitational force exerted by the Earth on a body of mass m on the Earth's surface can be found using the law of universal gravitation. The law of universal gravitation is an example of the inverse square law, where the force between two bodies is proportional to the square of the inverse of the distance between their centers. If the distance is doubled, the force reduces by a factor of four.
Whenever a resultant force acts on a body, work is done by the force. If a body accelerates under the action of a constant force, the quantity of work done by the force equals the force multiplied by the distance moved in the direction of the force. As force is measured in newtons and distance is measured in meters, work done is measured in newton meters or joules. One joule is the work done when a force of one newton moves its point of application one meter in the direction of the force. In the example below, the force, F, acts at an angle of theta degrees to the direction of motion of the body. If the force moves the object a horizontal distance d, then the work done by the force is F times d times the cosine of the angle theta. Note that work is only done by a force if the force moves a body. If a force is applied to a body and the body remains at rest, no work is done by the force. Energy is the ability to do work. It is a scalar quantity. The SI unit of energy is the joule, the same as the unit for work. A body or system that possesses energy can do work. In doing so, the body or system will lose some of its energy. A body or system that has work done on it can have its energy increased. In this case, the work done on the body is equal to the energy gained by the body. Kinetic energy is energy possessed by a body due to its motion. An expression for the kinetic energy of a moving body may be obtained by calculating how much work is done on the body to bring it to rest. The diagram below shows a body of mass m kilograms moving with a constant velocity v meters per second. A constant force, f newtons, acts on the body such that it is brought to rest in a distance s meters. It is possible to calculate the acceleration of the body. The negative sign indicates that the acceleration is in the opposite direction to the velocity of the body. The kinetic energy of the body must equal the work done by the force in bringing the body to rest and can be calculated to be equal to half mv squared. The potential energy of a body is the energy associated with the position of the body. In a gravitational field, the potential energy of the body is a property of its height. The potential energy possessed by a body of mass m kilograms at a height of h meters above the surface of the Earth is equal to the work which must be done on the body to raise it to that height. A force equal in size to the weight of the body and acting in the opposite direction must be exerted on it to raise it through the vertical displacement. The work done by the force against gravity is the force multiplied by the displacement. If a body with potential energy falls back to the ground, a quantity of energy equal to mgh would be lost by the body. The zero position for the calculation of potential energy can be any chosen level. Bodies above this level would be considered to have positive potential energy. Bodies below this level would be considered to have negative potential energy. The mechanical energy of a body or system of bodies is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies possessed by the body or system.
If a body of mass m is projected vertically upwards from point A with velocity u, it has to do work against the gravitational force. At a point B, the velocity has reduced to a new value. We have seen that the loss of kinetic energy from A to B is equal to the work done by the body against the downward force acting on it. Also, the potential energy gained by the body at B is equal to mgh. The loss of kinetic energy equals the gain of potential energy. The principle of conservation of mechanical energy can be stated as follows. The total quantity of mechanical energy which the bodies in an isolated system possess is constant. Mechanical energy is conserved if no external force other than gravity acts on the system and no mechanical energy is converted into other forms. A particle attached to a stretched elastic string possesses energy in the form of elastic potential energy. There must be a force, P, acting on the particle to maintain the string in its stretched position. This force does work in bringing the particle from the rest position of the string to the stretched position. If the force is removed, the particle begins to move due to the elastic potential energy. The elastic potential energy of a stretched string may be found by calculating the work done in stretching the string. In this case, the force applied to stretch a string is not constant, but varies with the tension in the string. The tension is directly proportional to the extension of the string. The work done in stretching the string is equal to the average force multiplied by the extension.
the momentum of a moving body is the product of its mass and velocity. Momentum is a vector quantity. The direction of the momentum vector is the direction of the velocity at any given instant. The SI unit of momentum is the Newton second. By considering Newton's second law of motion for a body changing its velocity under the action of a constant force, we can see that force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Impulse is the time-related effect of a force. The quantity Ft is the impulse of the force F, which is acting for time T. Impulse equals the change in momentum. Impulse is a vector quantity. The SI unit of impulse is the Newton second. We have seen that Newton's laws apply to any motion, however it is caused. They apply whether the force producing the motion or change in motion is constant or variable. As before, when the force varies in a known way, it is possible to represent the motion by a differential equation. Consider a variable force that causes a particle to change its velocity in an interval of time. The integral of the force with respect to time gives the impulse of the force. When a variable force, F, acts on a body for time t, such that F is a function of t, the impulse exerted by the force is as shown. When F is constant, the impulse is equal to F times T. The principle of conservation of linear momentum is stated as follows. The total momentum of a system is constant in any direction, provided no resultant external force acts in that direction. This is true in systems containing any number of bodies. Usually systems with two or three bodies are considered, and the principle is often expressed as either initial momentum equals final momentum, or the momentum before and after a collision is the same. When two bodies collide, they may either coalesce or rebound. If two bodies collide and coalesce, we say that the collision is inelastic. If two bodies collide and rebound, we say that the collision is elastic. Newton formulated a law known as the law of restitution, based upon experiment. The quantity represented by E in the equation is the coefficient of restitution and is a constant for any two particular bodies. For colliding particles, E can take any value from 0 to 1. The value of E depends upon the material of the colliding bodies. If E is 0, then the collision is inelastic. If E is 1, then the collision is perfectly elastic. In a perfectly elastic collision, there is no loss of mechanical energy during the collision. Most collision calculations do involve a loss in mechanical energy. If a smooth sphere travelling at right angles to a surface collides with it, we say that a direct impact has occurred. The surface exerts an impulse on the sphere, and if the impact is elastic, the particle rebounds. The approach speed of the sphere is u, and the rebound speed is v.
The impulse imparted by the surface is I. From the law of restitution, V equals EU, where E is the coefficient of restitution. Also, impulse equals change in momentum equals final momentum minus initial momentum. Taking the direction of the impulse as positive, I can be calculated as shown. Another example of a direct impact is when two smooth spheres moving along the same line collide. This can occur when the spheres are moving in the same direction, in opposite directions, or with one sphere stationary. In all cases, the law of conservation of momentum and the law of restitution may be applied. When elastic collisions occur, there is usually a loss in mechanical energy of the components of the system during the collision. The change in mechanical energy can be found by calculating the kinetic energy of the system before and after the collision.